chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. And Jonah, the story of Jonah goes, The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and cloth and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, no human or animal, no herd or flock, shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Humans and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, God changed God's mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Y'all know that clothing styles change all the time, right? When I look at old pictures of me from middle school and high school, I'm just mortified how I dressed when I was a teenager. I look at those pictures and think, oh my Lord. What I see really shocks me because they look horrible. You know, this is the 1970s, you have to remember. Do y'all remember the 70s? Well, I played basketball at that time. And our coach decided that every Friday we needed to dress nicely. I, you know, I was six foot tall, six feet tall at the time. I'm still six foot tall. And there were not any other tall women around. So it was really hard for me to find pants that were long enough. I'd have to, and uh, sleeves that were long enough. You know, I still have a hard time with that. But my mother was a seamstress. And she learned to sew at Iowa School for the Deaf. So she sewed all the time. And she made me two suits. One was blue and gray, or blue gray, and um, one was white with little spe colored speckles in it. Remember those uh, candy eggs that you have sometimes when you have the, the speckled candy eggs for Easter? That that's kind of what it looked like. So the sleeves were long and the pants were long, and I wore them on rainy day. It was great to have clothing that fit. Because remember during my time, there just were not tall women's clothes. Tall women got made <laughs> fun of. People called me olive oil. They just made all kinds of fun because I was so tall. So tall. You know, I was, I looked like a giraffe. I was tall and skinny with these long legs. I could not make weight. Finally, in my junior year in high school, another girl came in as a freshman who was six foot five, and I was elated because all of the tension came 
went from me to her. Anyway, back to my students. The clothes that my mom sewed still embarrass me when I look at those pictures. Because she sewed elephant legs, which were those big legs. Do you guys remember the elephant legs? They were huge legs on our pants. And I don't know if I was the only one who had those or not, but you know, there was so much fabric and my legs were so skinny that the fabric just dwarfed my legs. It's so embarrassing now to think about this. But clothes play a significant role in our culture, right? They represent our individuality. They can show our cultural values. They're a significant part of who we are. I did have some clothes from India that were not being used any longer, and they were really expensive items. They cost hundreds of dollars. And I think you all know, as I've said, I've um, got a Sikh friend from India that practices Sikhism, and they own a Greek restaurant. So I packed up the clothes. They were such good quality. They'd only been used a very few times. And I took them to her. She opened them up, looked at them, and gave them back to me. She said, no, we cannot be using these. I said, well, can't you in your Gadwara, which is their church? I said, aren't there some people who need some new clothing? And she just said, no, no, no. Our culture changes stat style very, very quickly, and those who are poor will scrimp and save so that they can have up-to-date styles, because if they do not have up-to-date styles, they will be ostracized. And I thought, what? Because I look in my closet and I've got clothes that I've had for 20 years. I've got a lot of old clothing. I mean, what I've got on are well over two years old, for sure. And I was really surprised. I thought they would be excited to get these high-quality clothing. But clothing was a real important part of their culture. Even though these look like new, they were out of style and would not be accepted. I tried to convince her, but she would not take them. So I was really surprised at that. I got another uh, story about clothes. Al won a trip to Jamaica. Al, you know where I'm going with this? You're going to laugh at this for sure. So he went to Jamaica. He won a trip having such great insurance sales. And maybe some of you remember we collected books for the School for the Deaf in Jamaica. Do you guys remember bringing books? So we went to the school for the deaf, we took our books and supplies that we had to donate. And if you've ever been to international travel, you know that people like to negotiate. If they're offering something for sale for $20 and you offer less, and they like to go back and forth and haggle. Well, we were on um, the Jamaican island was a booth that had piles and piles of t-shirts on them. Now Jacob and Noah wanted to buy some souvenir t-shirts. So they had uh, Pokemon t-shirts. Al, do you remember the story? So they had the Pokemon t-shirts and that's what they wanted. So I went ahead and bought them and then that night we had to go to dinner when we were supposed to be uh, fairly well dressed for that. Now we didn't have gowns or suits and ties, but we had nice clothing. How were the boys going to wear their new t-shirts? So I let them. We got into the elevator car, and there were a man and woman, and their son came in. There were the five of us and the three of them. We were rather crowded in the car. And we greeted each other with pleasantries. Finally, the woman said to me, I'm so sorry, but I can't believe that you're letting your two boys wear those t-shirts. And I looked at them, and I looked at her, and I said, what's the matter with the t-shirts? And she said, um, she couldn't believe that I didn't know what was the matter with the t-shirts. But I really did not have any idea what she was talking about. She said, well, the picture of the t-shirt is not Pokemon. <laughs> It says, Tokemon. And their eyes are bulged out and red. And when she pointed that out to me and explained what it meant, and you don't know, some of you Zoom folks are laughing, so you know what Tokemon stands for. 
hot. And I said, what? So before the elevator opened, I screamed, and then this woman helped me. We took the shirts off the boys, turned them inside out, turned it around their back, and then put them on. And the tag was hanging out the front of their neck. Yeah. Then the doors opened, and we went on into dinner. <laughs> I had absolutely no idea that Tokemon had something to do with marijuana. Oh my goodness. So clothing, let's say again, clothing is an important part of our lives. I'm still, you know, paranoid 100%, even though this happened a long time ago. You know, it could happen again. You know, sometimes I'll have to ask people what this means, because if I buy something. Because when you buy t-shirts, they can have slogans on there that seem innocent but really have a hidden meaning that you don't want. So I'm cautioning you to be very careful on what you purchase. In the scripture this morning, once again, they're talking about clothing. Last week, they talked about shoes and sandals. This week, they're mentioning sackcloth several times. Because all the people in Nineveh and all their animals needed to be clothed in sackcloth. In the first two chapters, I'm going to give you a little recap. What was Jonah thinking about? He was thinking about fish. When we hear the word Jonah, we think of fish. So anyway, forget the big fish story. We're talking about a different Jonah story. Sorry. So don't think about Jonah getting swallowed and then spit out of the fish. Think about something. We're focusing right now on Jonah and the people who lived in Nineveh. In the beginning, Jonah started with the word of the Lord, came to Jonah, told him to go and prophesy to the great city and cry out that the Lord has seen their evil ways. The people there were really very rough characters. They murdered, they raped, they slaughtered, they plundered. And there were lots of Israelites there. So can you imagine what it would feel like to know that, that there was a distinct group of people that were there to kill your people? They were incredibly brutal, just as Rome was incredibly brutal. So the Israelites were scared to death of them, just as they were scared to death of Rome. The Ninevites were just as bad to the Israelites as the Romans were. So the Lord commanded Jonah to go and let them know that the Lord was mad at them because they were doing evil. Can you imagine how scary that would be? That would be as if God called us to go somewhere that ISIS was and prophesied to them that God wasn't happy with them. I mean, the minute we started to prophesy, we would get beheaded. There is no doubt about it. Before we could even get the words out. Would you all pack your bags and go to an ISIS-controlled country and prophesy? I wouldn't. Please, God, don't ask me to do that. Right? That's something we just couldn't do. You know, ISIS wouldn't even allow a woman or an American or a Christian near them. Well, that's how Jonah felt at that time. That he was being commanded to go to Nineveh. You know, the church historically has judged uh, Jonah and deemed him a coward because he tried to flee from God. But really, I don't think he was a coward. If we were in his shoes, we would probably respond in exactly the same manner. But Jonah soon learned a hard lesson. So we need to attend to that lesson, because this lesson can apply to us. Jonah thought that God was limited to one place. And I need a box. Hey, Al, can you bring my box up, please? You didn't have any tape in your car, Robin? No, I didn't. This is my clock. Can you 
you all see that? It says Dios, God, on it. Jonah thought that God was limited in scope to this box, and that's it. He thought that God would not intervene with the Ninevites and save them. Jonah tried to keep God out of the box. But we cannot. We cannot limit God. And Jonah learned that the hard way. So in the rest of chapter 1, Jonah goes onto the ship. And many of the people were very superstitious, superstitious at that time. And they would try to figure out which of the gods were mad if there were high seas. And Jonah knew that he worshipped the one true God and that God was mad at him because he refused to go to Nineveh. So they were going to uh, throw him over the boat, even though they tried to figure out other ways to calm the seas. But they ended up having to throw Jonah off the side of the boat. And then he was swallowed by a gigantic sea creature. That's where we get the fact that he was swallowed by a fish, right? So then Jonah uh, thanked God for saving him by letting the fish swallow him up. And finally the fish spit him out on land. And all this happened in chapter 3. So then how did God react? God told Jonah once again to go to Nineveh. He told Jonah to walk through the entire city, which would take three days, and to proclaim that they need to stop sinning. Remember, that was a huge city. It would take three days to walk through it. But Jonah became a little rebellious. That was his personality. And he decided that he would just walk in one day and then make his proclamation that in 40 days, Nineveh would be overtaken and destroyed. And that's all he said. Then he left. Now that short sermon had quite an impact on the Ninevites. They actually freaked out. They started to clothe themselves in sackcloth. They sat covered in ashes. Even the king took off his royal robes, donned sackcloth, and covered himself in ashes. They did the same with all of their livestock, because they were trying to please God and show that they were truly sorry and were repenting of their thoughts and repenting their lifestyle. You know, sackcloth was mentioned 48 times in the Old Testament. The sackcloth was made from camels and goat's hair. It wasn't burlap. People think that it's made out of burlap, but it was not. It was made out of camel hair and goat's hair woven together. So all the livestock were clothed in sackcloth as well as the people, which is kind of astounding. Then scripture says that the sackcloth was used for three different purposes. And I'll show you the picture. Oh, here's a picture. This is burlap, but that's really not what sackcloth looked like. The reasons the sackcloth were used were when someone you loved died to represent grief. Secondarily, when your country was in trouble and you would not sackcloth and pray for protection. And thirdly, if a person wanted to repent, they would cover themselves in sackcloth and ashes, as you see in this picture. And in the story in Jonah, the king actually did that. The king and his subjects and all of the livestock were clothed because they were repenting. They were horribly sorry for what they had done. And what's very cool is today, we still use ashes, right? on Ash Wednesday, 
when we make the sign of a cross with ashes on our foreheads or our hands to show that we have repented. And we took that practice from this historical Hebrew practice of sackcloth and ashes. And we do that as a reminder to really delve deep and engage in repentance for that 40 days. It's an outward symbol to show that we are truly sorry. The king did this, the subjects did that, they were saying that they would change their evil ways when they stopped slaughtering people. Because they were terrified that God would destroy them and they recognized the wrongdoing that they had perpetuated. Then in chapter 4, Jonah and God have a very interesting conversation. Jonah's mad at God. Jonah's saying, why are you saving those folks? Why are you helping them? They're horrible people. Shame on you. What are you thinking? They are barbaric. I want you to punish them and destroy them and kill their families and their children. Do it, God. Jonah said, I knew you would do that. That's why I tried to escape. I knew that you are generous and merciful and slow to anger, that you are consistent with love, that you would relent and not punish. So why was Jonah upset about that? Why would Jonah be upset if God wanted to show this group of people mercy? Well, Jonah needed to learn his lesson. And we need to learn to learn our lesson too. So we need to really attend to this lesson. God cannot be put in a box. Cannot be put in your box or your box or my box or any else box. Don't just think that God can forgive the people we want God to forgive. Or God can love only the people that we want God to love. And I would think that God will accept one sin, but not many others. Now, our theology and our philosophy and our ideas of God and God are put in our own individual boxes, and then we try to limit God to what the contents are. But God is actually everywhere. God is omnipresent, which means God is everywhere. You and I and even Jonah could not encapsulate God in a box ever, no matter what you think. There is no race of people in the, this God box. There is no language limitations in God. God is absolutely everywhere. One of my posts on Facebook, I said, because God created everyone equally in God's image, everyone deserves to have food and hygiene products. Then one person from, um, from a kid said, um, that I had seen her a long time. Responded to me and said, No, that's not true. God does not love everyone. I was flummoxed by that. Jacob got a hold of me and said, You can delete that post. And I didn't know half of it. He told me how. That scared me that someone was trying to put limitations on the love of God. Because there are no limitations on forgiveness, no limitations on being forgiven for anything we've done in the past at all. And the whole point of the story of Jonah doesn't have anything to do with the fish that he was swallowed by, you know, after being thrown over the side of the ship and then regurgitated. That's not the point of the story. But people tend to, to perseverate on that. So I wish the pastor would stop preaching that part of the story and still focus on the point, which is God's love for everyone. Whatever you or I did in the past, whatever we did yesterday, Whatever you and I did this morning, whatever you and I will do tomorrow, we 
have to stop putting God in a box. If you think that God could not possibly forgive an individual, that's not true. I mean, God intervened and saved Nineveh. If we under, truly understood who those folks were, they were rapists, they were murderers. They were absolutely barbaric. God sent Jonah to warn them, and once they heard the warning, they changed, they put on sackcloth and acted ashes and repented. We do not make the decisions of who God forgives at all. So let Jonah be a constant reminded, reminder to us that when we try to limit God, that we need to take a step back and realize that God loves this person that we are trying to limit God's love to. And all we can do is pray and hope that they come to the Lord and repent. You know, our absolute worst sin is limiting God. Even our worst enemy, we need to welcome and warn and have direct them to God. And you remember, sackcloth was an outward representation of an inner change. So how can we show that we changed inwardly? We show that by sowing love and mercy and compassion. That's the sign, the outward sign of an inward change. Amen and amen. Now this morning I want you to put on your sackcloth and your ashes. Picture yourself closed with ashes and sackcloth. And just think, Lord, I am so sorry. Help me to repent inwardly. So we will be... Uh, now collecting our offering and taking communion together as children of God. God, clothe us inwardly 